Our scripture lesson is in the book of Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Believers who take their faith seriously struggle from time to time with this thought. I know that God has me on this earth to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. I know I'm here to make a difference for God. I know I'm here to impact lives for good. But how can little old me do that? How can I make a difference in this world? Especially as our society becomes increasingly and aggressively more hostile toward Christianity, almost seems like every day, how can we as believers make a difference? You know, you say the wrong thing to the wrong person, you go end up, you know, being sued or being attacked or, you know, how can we in our society today make a difference for God? I believe Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 4. I thought about titling this lesson, This Little Light of Mine in a Nuclear Power Age. Because doesn't it seem like, you know, we've got a little flickering candle in, in the midst of nuclear power and we feel overwhelmed and we feel overmatched, but instead I tried to call it more positively how we can impact our world for God. See if you can pick it up from Paul's teaching, Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, if you're as smart as you look, you've already got most of the blanks already filled in. Because <laughs> Paul tells us how to impact our world for God. Three very basic but supernaturally powerful ways that little old me and little old you can impact our world for God. And... As I've worked on this, I've been praying, God, help us to really be overwhelmed with this truth. Because a lot of times we feel like there's nothing we can do anymore. You know, so many of the avenues, those of us who are older, so many avenues that used to be open for the proclamation of the gospel are no longer. And so it's like, how can we impact our world first? by how we pray. My overwhelming burden for this hour is that each of us would leave this place today with a fresh, deeper understanding that when you pray, you make a difference. A lot of times, humanly speaking, we don't think it make you know, because we're, we're action people. And we think praying, well, we're not doing anything. We're just praying. No, that's the most important thing. The most powerful thing you can do is pray. James 5.16 still says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And Paul lists four qualities to guide our praying. First, he says, be faithful. Devote yourself to prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. You probably have it memorized in the King James. Pray without ceasing. You know, pray continually. In Luke chapter 18, it says that Jesus taught a parable so that his followers would always pray and not give up. 
now more than ever, those are the options, right? <laughs> Always pray or give up. And, and, and Jesus tells us in his parables, Paul tells us in this passage, you can impact your world for God by how you pray. Be faithful. Be devoted to prayer. Part of that is cultivating a consciousness of the presence of God. I know that I have mentioned this often in the last few months, but Brother Lawrence's prayer, practicing the presence of God, little devotional booklet that will put you under conviction. He was a kitchen helper in a monastery, and he said, my sink of dirty dishes is an altar of worship to God. And he talks about cultivating the presence of God wherever we are. Now, if I ever get on the elliptical trainer, I'm very conscious of the presence of God. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. You know, if you help me get off of this, I promise I'll never do it again. You know, <laughs> but, but we need to learn to be aware of God's presence wherever we are. You know, I, I encourage you, it, it'll feel weird if you're not used to doing it, but I encourage you to just keep up a running dialogue with God through the day. I mean, you know, you text your friends all day long, you know, text God, you know, just, you know, uh, something happens and it was good. Thank you, Lord. You know, that, that was really cool. That was neat meeting that person again, or it was so cool to see that, or they had my favorite food on special, you know, or what, just maintain a running, it always gets around to food with me, doesn't it? Maintain a running conversation with God through the day. Be aware of his presence. You know, you don't have to get on your knees and bow your head and close your eyes and fold your hands. We parents invented that to try to see if our kids would behave while we had our eyes closed praying. You know? But, but there, there's, you can pray all through the day. When, you, when something hits you, when there's a beautiful sunset, or you know, just maintain and develop a consciousness of the presence of God wherever you are. Now, there are times also when we need special times of prayer a special concentration in prayer. Before we make a big decision, we ought to be spending some extra time in prayer. Uh, when we feel spiritually kind of dry, we need to spend some extra time in prayer. And as we pray, we need to be persistent with it. You know, Jesus said, ask and it'll be given you, seek and you'll find, knock and it'll be open. The, the verbs that he used there, ask, seek, and knock, can literally be translated Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. It's okay to say, Lord, here I am again, and I'm praying about this one more time. You know, I'm here. I know I've prayed this every day or every week for the last 15 years. I'm going to keep on praying till I get the answer. And I'm going to be persistent, and I'm going to be faithful. That does not dishonor God. That honors him. Be faithful in your praying. Secondly, he says, be watchful. I love Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9. Nehemiah is leading the children of Israel in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. The enemies of Israel did not want that done. And so they were attacking them as they were building. And so Nehemiah said, we prayed to our God and we posted a guard. I like that. Because, you know, there would be some people who say, all we need to do is pray, just pray, just pray. God will protect us, just pray. Other people are saying, pray, you need a guard out there. Well, Nehemiah said, no, we need them both. And, and we need to be watchful as we pray. One translation of this verse says, keep alert in prayer. We, we, we need to stay alert for, for how the devil works. You know, the devil's sly, and, and he doesn't play fair. And the Bible says don't be ignorant of his schemes, his devices. 
We need to be alert to how the devil works. We need to be alert for things to pray about. You know, as you scroll through social media, what are people talking about? What are people thinking about? What's going on? Does it stimulate you to prayer? Don't let the, the media and social media drive you to distraction or despair. If you spend time on it, let it drive you to prayer. Let it give you, say, Lord, you know, we're in a mess. We need your help down here. I heard about a Sunday school teacher. She had a group of fifth grade boys, and uh, she wanted to teach them about praying. And so she said, I, I just want everybody to kind of be still and, and close your eyes and think about how things are going on in your life and then, then pray about that. And after a few seconds, one of the little boys said, Help! You know, sometimes that's the way it feels, isn't it? Lord, help. And, and, and we need to be alert for things to pray about. And we need to be alert when the answer comes. One of my favorite stories in this area is Acts chapter 12. Uh, when I preach on prayer, I usually spend a week on Acts chapter 12. And I either call it knock, knock, who's there? Or when the answer keeps knocking. It's a great story of human nature and how faith and human nature coexist. Peter has been arrested and is in prison. The church, the Bible said, is making earnest prayer for him. They've gathered in a house, and they are intensely, earnestly praying for Peter's deliverance. An angel shows up in the prison, unlocks all the doors, escorts Peter out. He thinks he's kind of having a dream or a vision until he realizes, I'm outside the prison, I'm on the city streets, I'm free. He knew where the church would be meeting, so he goes to that house and knocks on the outer door. And Rhoda, a young lady who's there, I cannot prove this to you biblically, but as a pastor, I believe she was keeping the kids. You know, she was the one that had the children over in that corner entertaining them while the grown-ups were praying. She goes to the door. She hears Peter's voice and is so excited that she doesn't open the door. She goes back to where the people are praying and says, Peter's at the front door. And that early church, that great, powerful early church said, no, he's not. He's in prison. And we're praying that he'll be set free. You don't understand. He's at the door. No, he's not. He's in prison. That's why we're here. We're praying he'll get set free. Finally, you know, the answer keeps knocking. And finally, they said, oh, it's this ghost. You know, so finally, somebody said, well, we might as well go check. And there he was. How many times in our lives has the answer been right there? And we've missed it because it doesn't show up in the way we thought it would or the timing we thought it would or the person we thought it would. And, and so we keep on praying and the answer's right there. We need to be watchful, be alert as we pray and be thankful. I think it's the New American Standard that says keep alert in prayer with an attitude of thanksgiving. It's interesting when you read the prayers of the Bible. They always begin with God. And often they begin with the reminder of how he has answered prayer in the past. And then they will talk about who he is. Then they make their request. That's what you know, talk about praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That wasn't a, a formula. That was them remembering God made promises to Abraham and he kept them. And he made promises to Isaac and he kept them. And he made promises to Jacob and he kept them. And when we pray, it's good to begin with thanksgiving. It's good to begin, Lord, thank you for the answers we have already received. And thank you for who you are and for what you're going to do. Keep alert in prayer with thanksgiving. And then I don't know if this is actually a word or not. I think it is. Be purposeful. Have a purpose in your praying. 
Paul says, and pray for us too. Your praying can't always be exactly specific. Lord, I need this, 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 and this. Sometimes the prayer has to be kind of general. But when you have the opportunity, pray with a purpose. Pray specifically. God, you see this person, you know what's going on in their lives, and then maybe you're aware of some of what's going on in their lives. And you can pray specifically with purpose for those things. Paul says, pray for us too. He's writing to the church at Colossae, miles and miles and miles away from where he is in Rome. But he knew that prayer can cross the miles. There's an old book that was written called Reaching the World from Your Knees. And we need to realize that. Our prayer can have purpose. And, and notice what he prays for. He, he, he asks them to pray that God would open a door for our message so that we can proclaim the mystery of Christ and I can proclaim it clearly. Now, I know that many of you pray on a regular basis for Donna and me and our family. We appreciate that more than we can say. We count on that more than we can say. And here's how you pray. If you wonder, Lord, give him an open door. Give him opportunities. And I'm not, I mean, I realize I have built in opportunities, but, but what I'm concerned about is that I have opportunities one-on-one -on -one to talk with people, to share with people how they can face their lives with Christ, how they can become believers with Christ. Lord, give them opportunities for the message and help him proclaim it clearly. <laughs> Little girl went home from church one Sunday and her mama said, what the preacher preach on? She said, I don't know. He never really got around to saying. <laughs> now, you know, when you're praying, God, help him proclaim it clearly. That's not just a prayer for me. That's a prayer for you. You know, so, so that, Lord, I can leave this place having kind of, some kind of an understanding of what he was saying. But you can impact your world by how you pray. Some of you support missionaries that are spread around the world. Pray for the open door. Pray for clarity as they present the truth. How important that is in our society. You know, it, it used to be, you know, <laughs> you know, I used to get tired of hearing old people talk about how it used to be. I have become an old person talking about how it used to be. <laughs> but, but, but how it used to be, you can just tell people they needed to get saved, and they knew exactly what you were talking about. You know, we live in a world that is basically biblically illiterate. And it's so important that we know how to share our faith with clarity. Not clarity to us, clarity to the people we're trying to talk to. That's an important prayer to pray. You can impact your world by how you pray. Second, you can impact your world by how we live. Verse 5, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Two things Paul says there. Guard your testimony and guard your time. Guard your testimony. Ha have you ever been in a group of people where a conversation turned to a subject on which Christians hold strong beliefs and you just cringed when one of the Christians spoke up and made things so much worse by the words they used and the tone they used and the, the attitude they showed and you just said, oh man, I just wish you'd just be still. You, know, you just set the cause of Christ back in the lives of everybody in here that's not yet a believer. We need to guard our testimony. We need to live in such a way that our influence draws people toward Christ, not away from him. They may not know to articulate it, but that they leave our presence with a more open 
attitude toward things of faith. You, I, you know, I've told you before that mom loved music and we always had music in the house, always had records, which is how you used to listen to music. And, and there was a, a song that got played over and over and over that said, what you are speaks so loud that the world can't hear what you say. And that's true. Joe Aldridge, in his incredible book, Lifestyle Evangelism, talks about words and music. He said, you got to have the music first. And the music is how you live your life. Then you can bring in the words. And, and I believe he's right. And I believe it's biblical. Guard your testimony. Live your life in such a way that people will listen when you speak. You probably have people in your life, and, I, and, and not just necessarily about faith, but you've got people in your life who are very opinionated about things, and you know that what they talk about doesn't match up with how they live in any area. And, and you just, you know, they can keep talking, and all you hear is the Charlie Brown, right? Because you know that they don't have any idea what they're really talking about because they're not living it. On any, you know, it's like me standing up here and telling you about my fitness routine. And then wah, 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 because you know I ain't got one. You know? and, and it's like somebody who's you know, on the verge of bankruptcy all the time talking about financial management. You, you just know, and, and it's some people that live like the devil talking about the Lord. We need to guard our testimony. We need to make sure that we're living in such a way so that when we speak, and that's the next point, people will listen. I remember reading a book, and I, I'm, I cannot remember the title of it, but she was talking about evangelism, and, and she was writing from her perspective as a college student living in a dorm, trying to be a Christian witness. And she said, you know, I'm not pretending to be perfect. I wasn't perfect. And there were times I had to go and apologize to people for how I spoke toward them or how I acted toward them. And she said, later in the year, somebody came up to me and, and they said, you know, what, what impacted us was not that you pretended to be perfect. What impacted us was when you came back and apologized for when you messed up. Then we knew something was real. Guard your testimony. And guard your time. Make the most of every opportunity. What a challenging verse. Make the most of every opportunity. Guard your time. And the words that Paul uses here has with it the idea of making the most of the strategic moments in your life. Now, sometimes we're in a strategic moment and we know it. This is important. What I handle, how I handle it, what I do, what I say, what I decide in the next 30 minutes, this is a big one. But there are other times when you don't realize how strategic it was till you look back on it. And think, oh, you know, that, that chance encounter really wasn't because that person became instrumental in me getting this job or this opportunity or whatever. And, and this conversation was more strategic than I realized because it helped somebody make a decision. And, and so Paul says, make the most of all the opportunities. Be alert to the opportunities that are around you. And, and, and how do you do that? I'm convinced that it flows out of how you pray. That as you pray, you say, Lord, Help me be aware of the opportunities that come my way. How many times at the end of the day did you give yourself that V8 slap and say, oh man, they ask a question and what an opportunity it would have been for me to talk to them about God and I missed it. Ask God to help us not to miss those opportunities. How can we impact our world? how we pray, how we live. And if you pray with impact and you live with impact, then how we talk. 
You can have conversations with impact. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You can make an impact in your world by how you talk. He tells us first it should be pleasant. Let your conversation be full of grace. Pleasant. The message paraphrases this, be gracious in your speech. The goal is to bring out the best in others in a conversation, not put them down, not cut them out. Do you eavesdrop on life as you live it? <laughs> I, somebody said to me one time, because I was in a room, I wasn't eavesdropping. I was in a room, the conversation was going on, and a, a, a couple days later, I referenced it, and they said, you listen to everything, don't you? I said, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm a preacher. You learn to listen to everything. But, but you know, if you eavesdrop your way through life, if you're tuned in to the conversations, sometimes you have, this, has, this has nothing to do with the sermon. It's just a funny story. It's a true story, but it's an illustration of what can happen when you eavesdrop your way through life. Y'all know the little prayer course that parents teach their kids, God our Father, God our Father, you know? We were out eating one night, and there was a Christian family behind us, and they had taught their little child to pray that prayer for grace. And so they asked him to pray. God our Father, God our Father, we thank you, we thank you. How are you today, sir? Very well, I thank you. <laughs> so it made me think, you know, if you're going to do a Christian song, make up your own song, you know, don't borrow Frere Jaca, you know. But, but, you know, as you eavesdrop your way through life, you can have some funny things. You can have some pretty serious things. That, oh, my, what in the world is going on at that table? And, and, and sometimes as you eavesdrop your way through life, you will learn that many, if not most, conversations are not pleasant. It's, you know, it's something about cell phones that, that people have lost any sense of privacy. Everybody's just tell, talking their business on their cell phone at lunch. And you hear you walk past this table and, and then she said, and I said, oh, no, we're not going to do that. And then, then she said, and you walk past the next table and I couldn't get him to do anything. I guess I'm going to have to fire him. And you go to the next table. I can't believe we just sat through that meeting again. And, and that's, there's not much pleasant. And if we can learn to be pleasant in our conversation, to be full of grace, by the tone of our voice, by the words that we say, you can make an impact. I encourage you to do that. And, you know, we talked last week about the, the challenges that so many small businesses are having, just staying open with the supply chain interruptions and, and hard to find people to work. You, you listen to some of those conversations and you realize there's some people just barely hanging on. And they need somebody to say, if you're going out to eat after church today, when somebody comes up to you to take your order, thank them for being there. Thank them for working. You know, be pleasant to them. Leave them a good tip. And for goodness sake, don't leave them a gospel tract if you're going to leave them a buck as a tip. You know, just, just, just be gracious. It makes a difference. Let your speech be pleasant full of grace, but also he says seasoned with salt. Uh, I, I just said it means it should have punch. <laughs> Not a physical punch, but it should have punch. You, there ought to be something to what you say. Seasoned with salt. Some of you are old enough to remember the um, was a financial brokerage firm or something, E.F. Hutton, and their old slogan, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. When you talk, do you have anything to say worth listening to? We, we need to ask God to help us 
speak words of, of insight and encouragement and comfort and peace. Sometimes correction when we've earned the right. But it's so important. And, and let me just make a statement about that. You earn the right to talk to somebody by first listening to them. We Christians for so long have talked at people, never listening. And we're answering questions nobody's asking. And we need to learn to listen first. And it's as I listen to you that I eventually earn the right to talk to you. And, and we need to understand that listening comes first so that when we speak, it's worth listening to. We have something to say. And, and at, again, I believe that all of this flows from how you pray. Lord, give me opportunities. Help me make the most of them. And when I have an opportunity to speak, let it count. Give me the words to I often pray, Lord, give me the words to say and how to say them. Because, you know, sometimes you can say the right words in the wrong way and you just have hurt yourself. Lord, help me to know when to speak, how to speak, what to speak. Guard my words. Have punch, and it should have a point. Yeah. He says, so that you know how to answer everyone. Your speech ought to have a point. That's an echo of what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. In Acts chapter 5, the apostles have been in prison. They get set free, and an angel says, you go speak the words of this life. We need to ask God to help us know how to answer the questions that are out there. That doesn't mean you have to take a 16-week class in how to answer every question anybody's ever going to ask you because the first question you get asked out of that class is not going to be one they cover. You know, you just, you just, you know the most effective way? You ever seen the bumper sticker that said, let me tell you about my grandchildren? There is no class ever been offered. I think I'm safe in saying that. There's no class ever been offered on here, grandparents, is how you talk about your grandchildren. No. If they're grandparents, they go talk about their grandkids. The same thing should be true of us as believers. Not that we beat people over the head with a, hey, you want to see my picture of Jesus? You know, no, we're, that, not that, but that our conversation just naturally is filled with faith. One of the greatest testimonies in the Bible is the man who was born blind. Jesus heals him. The enemies of Christ come to that young man and they say, who was that man that healed you? Was he a devil? Who was he? And the man said this, I don't have any idea who he was, but this is what I know. I was blind, now I see. And the next verse says, the enemies of Christ had nothing to say about that. The greatest way you talk is, I want to tell you the change Jesus made in my life. When people talk about their struggles, and again, you've earned the right to have the discussion. When people are talking about their struggles, and you could just say, you know, let me just tell you what works for me. Let me tell you about how I lean on God. Let me tell you about how I have found it works. Because most people are not asking questions about, well, you know, who's the Antichrist? Or, well, of course, now they're asking if the vaccine is the mark of the beast. It's not. But, you know, that mo most people, they're not asking those kinds of things. They're not asking you to debate the gap theory of Genesis chapter 1. They just want to know, can God help me get through my day? And if you have learned that, yes, he can, you have that opportunity. Little old me 
and little old you can impact our world for God by how we pray and how we live and how we talk. It's just that simple. Not easy, but simple. As you pray, again, I'm asking God to overwhelm us with the understanding at a very deep level that as you pray, you are impacting the lives of those for whom you're praying. That as you live your life as a believer and make the most of the opportunities, you are making an impact. Because all the world's getting darker and darker and darker. Jesus said, we're the light of the world. And you know what happens to light when it gets darker and darker, right? The light shines brighter and brighter. And then when you have that opportunity to have those discussions, make them count for the glory of God. Father, this is my prayer today that you would give us a fresh understanding of the power of prayer. We know the verses, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. We know all those, but sometimes we kind of don't believe it. So Lord, I pray you just overwhelm us with a fresh, deep, spiritual level understanding of the impact that we have through prayer. And then, Lord, help us as we endeavor to take your spirit with us, as we often say in here that our bucket is so filled with the water of the Holy Spirit that as we go through our day, you slosh over out from us and, and get onto the lives of other people. Lord, that, that our lives would just overflow with you so that as we go through our day, the daily routines and activities, we would do it as a person of impact. Lord, I know working in long-term care facilities, working in hospitals, I know that there's a difference between people who are people of faith and people who aren't. The nursing skills may be the same, but there's something different about an attitude of a person that walks into a room when they're a child of yours. They're, it, they're, it just shows Lord, may we be those kind of people that when we walk into a situation, the atmosphere improves, the tension relieves, the stress lessens, not because of anything we've said, but just because of your presence in us as we enter that situation. We all know there are people who can walk into a room without saying a word and make everything worse. Lord, help us to be able to walk into a room and make it better. And then, Lord, when we have the opportunities to speak up, may we make the most of those opportunities and may our speech be appropriate, that we would know what to say, the words to say, the terminology to use, the things not to say, and, and the manner in which to present it so that you are glorified through it all. Lord, we want to make a difference in the lives of people. When, when we leave a conversation, we want somebody to say, I'm so glad I ran into them. They encouraged me. They helped me. Lord, too many of us have too many people in our lives beating us down all the time. Help us to build people up, to be a shining example of what it means to be a follower of Christ in this world. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming out today. Thanks for tuning in. You're dismissed.